So we are in the fourth week of this series, To the Church Of, and um, I'm, I love this type of sermon series because I love methodically going through the Bible, but in an exciting way. I'm not, I love verse by verse, but I'm not the verse by verse teacher where it's just like, da 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 I have ADD, and by the third minute of the sermon, I'm out. But what we're doing in this series is we're looking in the New Testament at letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. There were seven churches that he wrote letters to, and today we're looking at the church of Ephesus. The Apostle Paul was writing these letters to churches, believers, um, in the first century, and he was trying to encourage them in the way of the Lord to keep the doctrine pure. He's warning them about cultural pressures and societal pressures, spiritual pressures around them, and he's, I mean, some of these letters are pretty hard-hitting. Uh, we've done Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, and today is Ephesus. If you've got a booklet on the way in, um, you can look at some of this info that'll be on the screen behind me. The author, again, is the Apostle Paul, and the date that this book was written was somewhere between 62 and 63 AD. Um, he was writing this letter while he was in prison in Rome. So he's in prison in Rome. It's not a good situation, and he's there, and he's finding himself, I don't know. If I'm in prison, I'll just say this. If I'm in prison, I'm human, just like many of you, and you're probably gonna think in those moments because we're human, God, I don't know if you are still for me. Paul did not think that. He was pushing through all of those emotions. In fact, was at a place where he could write one of the greatest documents in the Bible, the book of Ephesus. The audience, like I mentioned, is the church of Ephesus, um, and it was, used to, it was to be used as a circulatory letter uh, to surrounding churches in the area. The purpose, to teach them about identity and how to stand firm by loving one another in their culture, and the themes are identity, new life, unity through the gospel. So you're gonna see a lot of common themes in these letters, and I was actually having conversations with people this week. Each one of these letters to all of these different churches is so unique, but at the same time, so similar. A lot of the same themes. Here's a little bit of history with Ephesus. Before I show, tell you that, here's a map of where it is. Again, it's in the area of Turkey, in western Turkey. So Turkey back then, because of Galatia too, that was a hop in place back then, and Ephesus was on the western side, and this whole region, the city of Ephesus, was second only to Rome. So you have Rome as basically the epicenter of the world, and then a very close second was Ephesus because of trade, because of money, the economy. There was tourism in Ephesus. There was also a very famous temple there called the Temple of Artemis, and it was built in uh, 350 BC, and it was listed as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. This massive temple. I, I was looking at the dimensions, and the dimensions are 350 feet by 180 feet. This is much larger than an NFL football field. I mean, massive, massive temple. It was destroyed, then rebuilt, then destroyed again, all the way down to its foundations, and all is left there now are ruins in this area. So again, Paul is writing to believers in a city that is very corrupt, the economy is booming, the Roman Empire is surging, and there are all kinds of people. It's a melting pot of cultures. There is so much pressure on these people that he's writing to, much like today, except the economy isn't booming. But he's writing with a lot of the same pressures in society and culture as we're facing today. I'm gonna zero in on a passage, and I was, I was really trying to figure out what am I gonna preach on with Ephesus? What am I gonna preach on? I'm gonna to touch on today the idea of spiritual warfare. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians chapter six. But before I go there, um, I'll, I'll say this. We all have this, it's almost like we're born with it as little kids. We all have this innate understanding, this innate knowledge that there is good and evil in society. Good and evil. We, we just know it. We can, we can feel that there's good and evil. And every single, even little kid TV show and movie, it, you've got to have opposing sides. There's good and evil. There's a hero and there are 
villains. I have a collage of the, the Disney villains, and I know Disney is Disney right now, but at least we've seen all of these things. And you look at these villains, and what's weird is, is we know they're evil, but you also have this kind of like, ah, did you know villains at Disneyland are more popular with little kids than the heroes? There are longer lines for most of the villains. That'll tell you something about human nature. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'll, I'll never forget. You, I look at Scar up here. I'll never forget. I, I love the Lion King. I, I, anybody else like the Lion King? I love the Lion King. Um, and I'll never forget this. You know, we talk about villains. Simba goes away into the wilderness and he's gone. There's all these biblical things too. I'm sure Disney didn't mean to, but I'm gonna see him in there anyway. So Simba comes back from the wilderness and he's approaching Scar. Scar has destroyed all of the area around Pride Rock, all this stuff. And as a little kid, even as an adult, I was watching this a little while ago. I was like, my little daughter, Aslan, was like, Aslan, this is my favorite part. It's coming up, it's right here. You know, and Simba comes back and Scar sees Simba. Simba views himself as that little bitty cub that was afraid, that ran away all those years ago, and then he comes back, and he sees himself as the afraid little cub, but then Scar looks at Simba, and he sees Simba through the eyes of his father, Mufasa. That'll preach. You can clap. That'll preach, but that's not what my sermon is. But anyways, but I love that scene where Simba comes back and he fights Scar. It's the ultimate clash of good and evil and good prevails. Scar is Simba's equal. And we know this in every single movie and every single TV show. The best books, the best entertainment has a clash of good and evil. But when it comes to believers in the church, um, the statistics are all over online Far more people believe in the good side of the supernatural than even believers believe in the evil side of the supernatural. It's actually tripled. Three times the amount of believers believe in the existence of angels more than the existence of demons. Because we'll know that there's good and evil, but we don't want to put a name on evil because then I got to think about it. So it's gonna be like, yeah, it's out there, but I wanna know all the names of the good guys it's because I wanna know who's on my side. So today is about spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, and just a couple verses here, and I'm gonna pull the whole message out of this. And I know it's spiritual warfare, but we'll still, we'll still have fun today, I promise. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. Put on the whole armor of God. This is toward the end of the letter from the Apostle Paul. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is a loaded verse, and today I'm not going to pinpoint the armor of God. I actually preached on that in February. We're gonna look at the rest of this passage though, and we're gonna dive a little bit deeper in looking into who are these dark forces. What, what is their purpose in this world? What does it mean to me, and what exactly are they behind um, when it comes to all of the destruction in the world? Before I jump in, if you guys wanna take a picture of this next slide, I wanna show you, this is not all of them, but a great list of, spirit, or of scriptural references for spiritual warfare. Any of these verses, um, a couple of our verses today are from there, any of these verses would be great studies for you to read, to cross-reference and look at when it comes to spiritual warfare in your own um, Bible study time. You guys got pictures? You good, you good, you good? It's, it's okay, people are still going. It's okay, I'll wait. All right, all right, next slide. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12 again. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, and this is the part we're gonna zero in on for a second, stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. You know, whenever I am writing a sermon and I write out the word devil, you know, anytime I start talking about that Satan devil, there's always a handful of people in the crowd. You, I, I promise you, I, I, can, I can see a lot more than you think. Okay, so pe people are like, oh, the devil. This guy actually believes in the devil. Uh, yeah. Uh, you just gotta walk outside and look at the world and know something is behind this level of evil and corruption in the world. There are schemes of the devil, we're to, but corruption. <laughs> there are schemes of the devil everywhere. Christians are constantly attacked by an angelic tempter. This is what the Bible calls him, an angelic tempter, and his name is Satan. Satan 
Um, his name in heaven before he fell was Lucifer. Many of us know that um, his name meant angel of light, angel of light. So here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna do uh, three or four little lists today that'll help you understand a little bit more about spiritual warfare. And here's the first one. I want us to look, look at facts about Satan slash Lucifer. Facts about Satan. Number one, Satan is God's opponent, but not God's equal opposite. He is not God's equal. You know, there, there's so many, like, I saw this little uh, meme, I guess, that was being passed around on Facebook. Have you guys ever seen this? Jesus is sitting at a table and he's arm wrestling Satan. And people are like, if you really love God, share this. Don't do that. That's kind of weird. Okay, like, I love God, but I'm not gonna share Jesus arm wrestling Satan. We see these little images like Satan and Jesus are equals and they're warring against each other. The truth is Satan is warring against God, but God is not warring against Satan because God is all powerful. He is the creator. He is the most powerful God in the entire universe. It is him. He's not worried about Satan when it comes to himself because Satan is not his equal opposite. Why? Because Satan is a created being. He is an, an angel and he is a fallen angel, a fallen angel. We see the story of him falling in the Old Testament in several places, and Jesus actually in the New Testament references it in Luke 10, 18. It says, Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Isn't it interesting as Christians sometimes, because Jesus, in, in accordance to his name, started in the New Testament, that we kind of just think that's where Jesus started. But Jesus gives us a glimpse at the dawn before time, and you're looking at this, and you're thinking about all this stuff, and Jesus gives us a glimpse. He is watching, he is watching the rebellion of Satan against God the Father. And God the Father, with a snap of his fingers, sends Satan and a third of the angels that warred against God in heaven down to earth to be the princes of earth. And Jesus says, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. The second fact about Satan is, Satan can only counterfeit what God creates. I talked a lot about that last week. You can watch that message if you weren't here. But God creates, Satan cannot. He can only mimic, he can only distort, and he can only counterfeit with false truths. Number three, Satan's future judgment and defeat are certain. It's certain. Satan loses in the end. And it's not God who fights Satan, it's another angel who fights Satan. It's not even worthy of God the Father's time to entertain a battle with Satan. He sends an archangel to defeat Satan in the end. I love it. Number four, Satan is the lowercase g God of this world. The reference there is 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It's a false dominion. He does have dominion, but he's living in a little bit of a false reality, again, because he loses in the end. But he is allowed he is allowed on this earth to tempt, to distract, and to incite evil in willing vessels. And when it comes to this idea of him being the lowercase g God or prince of this world, you can look at the temptation of Jesus. When Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted, Satan comes to Jesus offering him things. I wanna offer you this land. I wanna offer you these riches. I wanna give you these things because right now he has dominion over this fallen world. But the resurrection was a huge reminder to Satan, sin and death have been broken and you lose in the end. Number five, Satan can only defeat you if you allow him to. So right off the bat, before I go into any of the message, spiritual warfare messages on this have nothing to do with you leaving and being afraid or trying to find a demon behind every rock you stub your toe on. It's not like that. We don't have to be afraid because Satan can only defeat a believer if we allow him to. Why? Because when we accept Christ, what I talked about last week, we now become the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit resides in us. I've had people in the past, whenever you do Q&As, one question that always comes up is, can Christians become demon-possessed? People are fascinated with demon movies and demon possession movies, and, and they're so like Hollywood-ized. But here, people want to know, can they? No, 
Because how can one space be occupied by two different entities? You have the Holy Spirit. I am filled with the Spirit. Therefore, I cannot be filled with something else. And a reminder, it is that Holy Spirit who was the power behind the resurrection. That's the power we have living inside of us. So Satan, again in this scripture, uses many schemes. It says the schemes of the devil. This comes from a Greek word um, called methodia. And these schemes enter our individual lives, our families, the church, and the world. That There's no area that's safe from the schemes of the devil. I'll, I'll give you a personal example for you because all of you can think of this. There's probably been an area in your life in the past that Satan has come after you and come after you with temptation, 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 and it's been that one area. Over time, as you grow in your faith, you shore up that area, you get accountability, you take it out of secrecy, out of the darkness of your soul, you let people know, you repent of it, and now no longer is that one specific thing the thing Satan uses. And you go, whoa, finally, those one or two areas, I'm done. Now I can live my life and basically I'm invincible. No, 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 no. Because the moment you shore that up, Satan is looking for another open area in your life that you don't have the shield up, you don't have the guard up, because what he's looking for are areas you are not looking at. That's what Satan is coming for in our lives. And he comes with these things. These are the schemes. They're behind me. Disunity, especially, especially amongst believers. Disunity in marriage. Disunity in families. Personal sin, personal temptation. He knows that personal sin that can latch onto you that you keep repeating will eventually destroy your life. False teachers in the church. Paul talked a lot about false teachers in these letters. There are different random theologies going around and what's so crazy awesome about the internet is so crazy bad about the internet and social media. We can expand the gospel further and faster than ever before, but also false teachers are spreading things faster and further than ever before. We have to be on guard with it. He comes at us with discouragement. Apathy is a huge part of this. Suffering. I was talking to my counselor the other day and we were talking about why so many people in the younger generations, it feels like there's a lot of apathy. I don't care. What do you wanna do when you're older? Eh, I don't care. There's a lot of apathy and what my counselor was saying, I think it's brilliant, is that one of the schemes of the enemy is to create option fatigue in young people's lives where this is a time in history where young people have more options at their disposal to do anything they want. The weight is piling on their, on their lives, on their soul, on their spirit. And what's happening is it's not originating as apathy. It, what it really is is anxiety from option fatigue in the world. And it's increasing and increasing and increasing, but Satan will use it to create apathy and then suffering so much suffering. These are the schemes, the methods of the devil. You guys with me today? You learning something? All right, next section, Ephesians 6, 11 through 12. Again, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And here's the part we're going to zero in on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood. Now, this came as a very blunt Scripture and confrontation from the Apostle Paul as he's writing from a prison in Rome. Now think about this. He's writing from a prison in Rome with guards around him who have beat him to the point of death. They're starving him. They're throwing him in a cell. And he's writing, my battle is not against them. It's not against flesh and blood. It's not. It's against the principalities in the next part of the message. But he's saying, your greatest battle is not against other human beings who have wronged you. That, that's not what this battle is about. And he's very careful because he doesn't take away human responsibility. If someone has wronged you, they made the decision to wrong you. And they will be held responsible. But what Paul is saying is there is something beneath that person wronging you that is driving the evil within. Because what happens is, if we're not careful, we open ourselves up to temptation. And when we do that, Satan can use 
us when we open up our vessel. He's not possessing us, but he will use people. And a great example of this is in the New Testament, right before Jesus goes to the cross, when he's talking about his death and what's about to happen, the apostle Peter comes up to him and says, no, Jesus, I, I, I don't like this plan. We don't want you to die. And what does Jesus say? He looks back at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. He knows the battle isn't against Peter being obstinate. He knows Peter has had a weak moment and Satan is leveraging his weak moment to come at him. And Jesus is giving us a picture in that story and how we can move past hurt. Yes, it's big. Yes, we need to deal with it properly. If you need to go to counseling, go. You don't have to reignite and, and bring back relationships that are damaging. But when we know there is an evil beneath the hurt of people, you can move on. You can forgive. You can even learn to love. Yes, the person's responsible, but this passage is saying also, Satan is beneath it, looking and scheming, and our battle is not against flesh and blood. And what we have a tendency to do, especially at election seasons, what we have a tendency to do is to look at people, evil politicians, whoever you think those are, and say, they, they're the problem. And we paint evil on people, and Satan is laughing all day because we're forgetting that there is an evil beneath what we're calling evil. You look at all these things going on in the world with sex traffickers and pornographers and, and all of this different stuff that's bringing destruction in our world right now, corrupt leaders in the world, politicians, whatever it might be. And all of us, if we're not conscious of this verse, we will forget and we will put our whole identity into human beings. If this person gets elected, if we can just get that person out, if we can just destroy that person, then everything, no, it won't. Because there's an evil that will jump to the next person. And there's an evil that will jump to the next person. We have to understand that our battle is not against flesh and blood. We have responsibility to make good decisions. I'm not saying don't vote, vote. We have a responsibility to do our due diligence as citizens here right? Because we are citizens of heaven called to be citizens here. But what I'm telling you is our hope cannot be in any of that because our struggle, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Another thing that's interesting here is this wording here is a present tense verb, meaning that this is an ongoing battle that will not end until we go to heaven. This battle happens every single day. That's why we have to be conscious of the battle every single day. So again, people have responsibility but we have to remember there's someone scheming behind every single person. So who is, what is the actual struggle against? If we're not struggling against flesh and blood, then who is our struggle against? The verse continues. Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, I, I've read that, honestly, my whole life. I have never preached on this part of this verse, and it was fascinating studying what these four different things mean, these different parts of a hierarchical system with demons. So I wanna show you what these four phrases mean and what the assignments are of demons. And I know if you're new to church, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this, are you serious? This is the day I came. But I just think it's fascinating. One of the things that's fascinating to me when we look at demons is the same demons who were possessing people that Jesus cast out in the New Testament are the same demons that are tormenting and possessing people today. Isn't it interesting that somewhere along the line in history, we started naming demon possession different things and forgot about the schemes of the devil. We stopped naming demon oppression. We stopped even talking about the facts that there is demonic oppression and things happening in our world and now it's just flying right under the current and we begin to name all of these different things that in Jesus' day, he would walk up to somebody and say, I need to cast something out of them, right? Not just walk them through something. Demon hierarchy, let's look at this. Number one, rulers from the verse. What are rulers? 
These are the most powerful demons with the highest rank. We also see this on the angelic side. The most powerful demons with the highest rank. Most historians believe when the demons fell, because angels, there's also a system, a hierarchical system in heaven, that when these demons fell, most of them would have kept their same ranking and just got new assignments on earth. Rulers are the most powerful demons with the highest ranks. Number two, authorities. Powerful demons with delegated authority, right under rulers. So the rulers would delegate their authority to these authorities and they would carry it out with other demons. The third group are powers over this present darkness. These are demons with specific assignments for specific individuals or specific geographic locations. Isn't that interesting? In the book of Daniel, there's a story where Daniel's fasting. It's where the Daniel fast comes from. And he's asking God for an answer. After 21 days, an angel finally makes it to Daniel. And Daniel's like, what took you so long? And the angel said, I was on my way, but the prince of Persia contested me, fought me for days. And I actually had to have help from other angels. The prince of Persia was not the physical prince of Persia who would have been no match for an angel. It was a power over this present darkness. It was a power over a region, a geographic location. And that is all through scripture. And again, it's fascinating. There are demons with specific assignments in the area of the United States, in different parts of Africa, different parts of Asia, all over the world. Because cultures are different, the attack has to be different. Number four, spiritual forces. I think this is interesting too. Most theologians and historians would say that this is very similar to our special forces in our military with unique special skill sets to battle humans with unique special callings and assignments. You know, what's fascinating to me is we love talking about how, like, do I have a guardian angel? Maybe, I don't know. The Bible never says it explicitly. It's possible. But guardian angels are specifically assigned, if they're real, are specifically assigned to you. But isn't it interesting that the Bible says all of us have callings and assignments, all of us are uniquely created, and there is a whole legion of demons that are specifically assigned, a special forces of demons specifically assigned to people with special assignments and special callings for such a time as this. Whenever we feel like the instance of God saying, I, God, I really feel like this is what you're wanting me to do. This is a new season for me. We finally have clarity on God. Yes, this is what I'm supposed to do. That is not the time Satan just rolls over and goes, oh, we're done for. That's the time the special forces are sent to you. God's hand is on you. His spirit is with you. But the demonic forces are looking for openings. They're looking for spaces in our lives as we pursue our calling to bring destruction into our lives. Are you guys still with me? Is, it, is this interesting? All right, all right. Just making sure, making sure. Okay. It's interesting to me, so that's, that's why I'm preaching. Okay, so I wanna show you something that I worked on this week and I found some stuff online and um, I worked on this and I think this will really help. So before it goes up, it's gonna be overwhelming, but just, just listen to me and I'll, I'll kind of show you where to get this. I wanna show you a, a spiritual warfare graph that you can look up. Now, I, I know, ah. so here's what's cool. There's a QR code on either side of the screens, and if you click on that QR code, it'll take you straight to a link, a, a website where this uh, image is on there, where you can zoom in at any time right now as I go through some of it. Um, you can take a look at this, but I think this is a really interesting way of looking at spiritual warfare and what the world looks like if, if we're losing spiritual warfare versus what the world looks like if we are winning spiritual warfare. So I wanna zero in on a couple things. And so obviously Satan working in the world is this side. God working through the church is this side. If we can go to the next slide and zero in on Satan working in the world real quick. Um, so if we look at this, you've got demonic forces of this world and it has their character at the top. What is their character? They're dark, devouring, deceptive, and divisive. What's their mission? Their mission is to dethrone God. It's been that since the very beginning. To destroy God's creation, us to deceive and to divide. That's a huge, division is huge. God is all about unity. One of the themes of every single one of the New Testament letters, the epistles, unity is one of the themes, okay? Satan comes to divide. What are their weapons? Their weapons are darkness, destruction, deception, distraction, deflection, dilution, and then there's division, accusation, and slander. So how do they divide? How do they divide? Accusation and slander. Huge, it's happening all over right now. Now, 
our battle on earth, humans battle on earth against uh, the spiritual forces. The physical effects, if Satan working in the world is being magnified and he's winning. There's rebellion, these are, the char- these are some of the characteristics. Rebellion, anarchy, violence, and wickedness. Okay, the other physical effects, and this goes all the way over to devouring, decay, disease, and death. Just think about all these times we're living in right now. Rebellion, anarchy, violence, wickedness, decay, disease, death, oppression, excess, delusion. You keep going. The divisiveness again, and then physical effects, self-interest, prejudice, divorce, and isolation. I want you to think about this. When it comes to divorce, divorce is not God's plan, but whenever a couple gets divorced, there is always one, at least one person in that couple, or maybe both, but sin is always involved with breaking up a marriage, always. There are innocent parties and there are guilty parties, but it's sin that breaks apart a marriage. It doesn't make the innocent party sinful, But it is sin, why? Because marriage is what is used in the Bible as the picture of what our relationship with God is supposed to be. The church is called the bride of Christ. So Satan attacks marriage. How can I deform marriage? How can I twist marriage? How can I break apart marriage? And how can I get it as far away as possible from the image that God used for our relationship with him? So Satan is big. On, on dividing marriages, and then also isolation is huge. That's what we've been going through for the last two years. Now, spiritual, it's, I'm gonna ask you one more time. I just gotta know, because I got two more f- services after this. Do I need to change my sermon, or is this good? Okay, okay, I'm like, whew, I gotta make sure. Okay, spiritual results, I don't have time to, but I was just asking. Spiritual results if unsaved. I was doing it no matter what, guys. This is spiritual results for me for unsaved people. Remember, because we are saved. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Blindness, spiritual blindness, pride, faithlessness. So think about the, the world right now, friends that don't know Christ, despair, apathy, and eventually when we die, eternal death. Bondage, emptiness, indifference to God, fear, condemnation, and separation. Separation from people who love them. Separation from the church. Now let's go to the other side. God working through the church. Now if you notice, it's not, and I didn't put in here, it's demonic forces versus angels because it's not like we stand back here and go, all right, they're all fighting. And no, for whatever reason, God says, this is your fight. So it's, it's us, okay? God working through the church. Our battle on earth, okay? So if we're winning the battle, the church of Jesus Christ, The physical effects are um, submission, order, peace, godliness, restoration, healing, renewed life, freedom, contentment, discernment, self-sacrifice, acceptance, family, community, the spiritual results if saved, sight, faith, humility, trust, joy, hope, eternal life, grace, abundance, wisdom, Respect, mercy, and communion. Not communion as in the the act of communion, but communion with other believers. What are our weapons? Light instead of darkness. Public worship. Good works. Um, Salt is another weapon. Influence, meaning influence with others. And prayer, truth, is another weapon. Preach the word. Be, Be fruitful. Fight for the faith. Paul commissioned Timothy, and that's what he said. You've gotta preach the word. Because the Bible, the word of God, is the sword. It's the offensive weapon. We've got to preach the truth. Love, neighborly love, brotherly love, Christ-like love, hugely important. Our mission, illumination instead of darkness, restoration, renewal, preservation. Our our mission is also revelation when it comes to the truth of, of of the gospel. Reconciliation instead of division. Jesus' life in us. He is the light, the life, the truth, the way, and God living in us over here through Holy Spirit power leads to repentance, seals and comforts, teaches, guides, helps, equips, and empowers. So I think that's awesome. And so when you look at this, what's fascinating to me, go back to the big image if you would again, our battle on earth is the center. The big one if you would, real quick. There you go. Our battle on earth is the center. And this is where the world is constantly teetering back and forth. Where are we gonna be? And it all comes back to, does the church understand the mission? Do we understand who we're supposed to be? 
Do we understand that church is not an institution, it's you? Do we understand true Holy Spirit power? Do we understand godliness? And do we understand that there are demonic forces on the other side at work and we have the power of the resurrection living inside of us? I want you guys to, to take this link and study it, find it fascinating, talk to your kids about it, talk to friends about it, whatever you wanna do with it. But again, it shows you what happens when who's winning. And it feels like this season on earth Darkness is prevailing, but I've got hope. That's why I'm a pastor. It's why we push so hard as a church. We believe churches can turn cities around, regions around, nations around, because we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. I wanna end with a quick story from 2 Kings um, chapter six, and it kind of gives you a visual of God being on our side. Elisha is the prophet at this time, and he is under siege and his servant is afraid, and this army is advancing against them, and Elisha, they're, they're by themselves, and, and Elisha doesn't seem to be afraid, but his servant is ridiculously afraid of the army marching against them, and it says this in 2 Kings six fifteen through 17. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city, and the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? That's what I would say. If you go out and an army's advancing against you, I'm gonna say, what are we supposed to do? Because that's what it sure feels like when I watch my kids go into public schools, when I watch people walk out into the community every day we live our lives, that's what it feels like. We're outnumbered. There's an army of darkness marching against us. How are our kids gonna make it? What is our country gonna look like in 15 years? What's our world gonna look like in 25 years? The army is marching against us and it feels hopeless. What shall we do, he said? Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are far more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. You know, I love this image because when we feel surrounded, when we're in spiritual warfare, when it actually feels like all hell is breaking loose, we have kids that have run from God and they won't come back. Our marriage is on the rocks and it doesn't seem like there's hope. Finances are spiraling out of control. There's confusion, depression, anxiety. All hell is breaking loose and we're surrounded. Elijah said, God, let him see. Because when you are surrounded, the enemy is surrounded by God. And that's what this image is. In my lowest moments over the last couple years, I've literally, some people have a figurative prayer closet. Mine is my closet. It's kind of awkward, but... I go into my closet. I remember these couple times I got down on my knees and I just said, God, I need to see. Because I don't see, I don't see your army right now. I have prayed. I have done everything you've told me to do. I need to see. You may not see the physical our angelic army, but when you humble yourself before God, it's okay to feel like you're losing the spiritual battle. He's not gonna be mad at you. Sometimes you just need to go to God and say, God, I need to see. I need to know you are with me and that this army who surrounded me, that that army is surrounded by you. Because if I know the army's surrounded by you, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it through this trial. I'm gonna make it through this valley because although the devil is scheming, our God is willing. He has a will for your life. He has a calling for your life. No scheme of the devil can distract you. No scheme of the devil can destroy it. When you are in Christ, you have the power of the Holy Spirit, the call of God, the assignment of God, and you can charge with confidence knowing God has surrounded the army that has surrounded me. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 8, 31, and it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's not an actual question needing an answer. What Paul was saying is, God is for you, 
and no one can stand against you. No enemy, no devil, no demon can stand against you when we fight spiritual warfare. So today, here's what, how I wanna end. I want, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes, if you're in the room today and you're just in that season where you do feel like it's just been a big battle. When I was talking about all hell breaking loose, you're thinking that's, that's me. It might be my family, might be my marriage. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and some of you may not be able to even because people sitting around you and that's fine. But if you are willing right now when I ask you to, to raise your hand, I, I, wanna, I want you to raise your hand and look at me and I wanna pray for you. And I want this prayer to, to ignite something in you, to ignite the warrior in you, to ignite the fighter, to stand up and say, I can fight this battle because the God that is for me is so much greater than the enemy that's against me. If you're going through one of those seasons, would you just raise your hand right now, right where you're at? I see you, I see you. Thank you guys, just keep it up for a second. I see you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can put them back down. When I pray this prayer, this is what I want you to pray. Just in your own mind, under your breath, out loud, however you wanna do it. I just want you to pray, God, let me see. Open my eyes to the reality that you're fighting for me. Renew my faith, renew my heart. Renew me today, God. Give me a renewed strength in my life. That's what I want you to pray as I begin to pray. And I just believe that the Holy Spirit will fill you up. That power that gave Jesus his breath in the tomb resides in you, if you're a believer right now. That power resides in you. But that power will not force itself on you. We have to say, come Holy Spirit, fill me, empower me, ignite me, and bring out the warrior within me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for every person that raised their hand. So many people are going through seasons right now of hurt and pain, struggle, battles, battles of mental health, depression, anxiety, marriage, brokenness, rejection, divorce, losing jobs, children that don't know Christ, rebellion in the home. People have to carry so much, God. And I know that you said we can cast our burdens on you, come to you when we are weary, and that's what we're doing right now. We're coming to you, Jesus, and we're casting our burdens on you, and we're asking you to open our eyes to the angelic armies, the warring angels that are on assignment for me. We thank you, God, for being the God who surrounds our enemies as our enemy surrounds us. Strengthen us, give us peace, give us rest, and give us strength as we fight in these spiritual battles. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.